So then I can share the screen. It should be around 100 people. So, so. Oh, fantastic. Some should be here. I can let everybody in and then mute myself. And Stefan is going to pass me the ball when he's finished. Okay, top. Thanks, Rosman. Lässt du alle schon rein, oder, Herr Wohl? Ja, ja. Top. Es sind noch ein paar im Warteraum, dann starten wir gleich in Kürze. Noch ein, zwei Minuten. Dann können wir loslegen. Warteraum noch 30. So, dann äh, legen wir los, Rastmann, oder? Ja, genau. Ja, genau. Perfekt. Ich lasse die restlichen noch mal langsam rein. Jawohl. Dann, ähm, ich darf mich ganz kurz vorstellen, mein Name ist Stefan Merkel, ähm, Landestrainer vom Bayerischen Basketballverband, auch mit meinem Kollegen heute hier, Rast von Montinao. Und ähm, ich darf heute den Markus Klusemann vertreten, der gleichzeitig auch noch in einem wichtigen Meeting ist, aber wahrscheinlich später noch dazukommen wird. Und ähm, ja, ich freue mich sehr, dass wir heute wieder eine Coachklinik beim BBV anbieten können, heute mit dem Thema Pick and Roll und Skills. Ähm, bevor wir da starten mit äh, unserem ähm, Referenten, äh, mit dem Alex, ähm, würde ich ganz kurz äh, noch vielleicht kurz mit euch die Regeln so ein bisschen durchgehen. Also ich glaube, wir sind immer ähm, freundlich äh, im Wortlaut. Ihr seid äh, immer automatisch stumm geschalten am Anfang, äh, könnt aber Fragen in den Chat schreiben und wir schalten euch dann immer, immer frei. Ähm, wichtig ist, dass ihr ja, ähm, auch guckt, ähm, dass ihr vielleicht aktiv dabei seid. Also dann füllt sich das Ganze immer natürlich mit mehr Leben. Und äh, da ist es natürlich immer toll, wenn ihr die Kameras anhabt. Aber ähm, bei schwacher Internetverbindung seht ihr ja auch schon äh, die Kameras ausschalten. Dann ist die Übertragung immer ein bisschen besser. Und ähm, ja, für euch ganz kurz, ähm, da gehen wir gleich noch drauf ein, äh, Rastmann, auf die BBV Coach Clinics. Ähm, für euch noch ganz kurz, also wichtig ähm, ist, es gibt keine dummen Fragen, sondern stellt alle Fragen, die ihr habt, weil das ist, glaube ich, immer eine einmalige Chance, jetzt auch gerade während Corona ähm, immer ziemlich viel mitzunehmen. Deswegen ähm, gebt da besonders ähm, viel Gas. Ähm, ja, ich darf noch darauf hinweisen, wir haben eine BBV Online Coach Klinik ähm, immer und äh, bieten aber auch gleichzeitig für unsere Jugendteams äh, Wettkämpfe an. Und da haben wir eben am 18.04. Ähm, in einer neuen Arena, die wir noch bekannt geben werden, ähm, wieder sechs Challenges für unsere Jugendteams vorbereitet, ähm, wo ihr als Trainer auch mit euren äh, Teams teilnehmen könnt. Und dann spielt ihr vielleicht gegen Mannschaften wie Alba Berlin, Bayern München äh, und so weiter. Deswegen ähm, ganz äh, tolle Geschichte. Ähm, kann ich nur jedem empfehlen, ähm, am 18.04. Ähm, da vorbeizuschauen. Den Anmeldelinks seht ihr hier. Wir schreiben ihn später auch noch in den Chat und ihr könnt das Ganze auch auf unserer Homepage ähm, mit einsehen. Genau, jetzt aber, glaube ich, genug vom Intro. Jetzt seid ihr alle heiß, äh, Input zu bekommen. Und ähm, deswegen würde ich gleich an meinen äh, Landestrainerkollegen, den Rasfan, übergeben. Und der stellt euch dann gleich unseren heutigen Referenten vor. Ähm, vielleicht noch ein kleiner Hinweis, wir zeichnen auf. Das heißt, wenn ihr halt nicht gesehen werden wollt, schaltet die Kameras einfach aus. Ansonsten freuen wir uns natürlich über jedes Gesicht, das wir sehen, damit wir aktiv ins Gespräch mit euch kommen. Gut, Rasfan, wie schaut's aus? Legen wir los. Ja, hallo auch von meiner Seite. Danke, Stefan. Äh, danke äh, alle oder hallo an alle, die heute da sind. Ähm, heute ein, ein sehr, sehr interessantes Thema. Wir werden gleich auf Englisch switchen ähm, und werden mit, äh, haben heute mit Alex Arama jemanden, der schon mal hier war. Gott sei Dank, dieses Mal ist die Technik besser und wir hoffen, dass wir nicht so viele Probleme haben und, und alles, alles viel, viel besser läuft. Ähm, ja, Alex äh, ist jemand, der sich sehr, sehr viel im, im, im Bereich Schulung, äh, Individualtraining weiterentwickelt hat ähm, und je, von jemandem, den wir auch als 
Verband und auch wir Landeshinder sehr, sehr guten Kontakt haben, sehr viel gemacht haben die letzten Monate. Und ja, wir sind sehr, sehr gespannt. Das Thema Pick and Roll ist ein sehr interessantes und sehr weites Thema, was, was, wir, was wir uns gleich vorstellen wird. Und jetzt würde ich dann auf Englisch switchen. Stefan hat schon gesagt, wenn ihr Fragen habt, einfach in den Chat reinschreiben. Wir werden euch dann dran nehmen, dass ihr sie persönlich Alex stellt. So now, Alex, I, I'm switching to, Ger uh, to English. Sorry, I, uh, I know you understand German a little bit. Hopefully <laughs> it wasn't that, that hard. Uh, before we start with everything, I, I want to, uh, so we know each other, I think now six months, we, we had a lot of good talks and uh, a lot of uh, uh, things that changed my uh, view over teaching uh, basketball and, and made me think about it. My, my, my only question before we start would be, um, what is your goal? Why do you, do you, do you, are you so active bringing this CLA stuff to, to everybody? And what, what is your goal doing that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when I look at why I coach, first and foremost is to have an impact, obviously, on, on the players I work with. But more, I'm mostly focused on coach education now. I think we see a lot of traditional things in the basketball world. And just the results I've seen working with constraints that approach over the last few years have been beyond even my wildest imaginations. And I'd love for other coaches to be able to just go through the same journey that I've experienced and just see the positive impact it has on your players. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. And now I'm really, really, uh, yeah, I, I really want to see what, what you want to show us today. Good. So I'm going to start with a little introduction on pick and roll. And I think when we traditionally look at pick and roll, um, there are a lot of different philosophies as to when to teach it, what age group, um, and how to, how to go about it. So today, I've actually just, over the last week, I had a sprint week here at college in Italy. So a sprint week is where I do something, do one particular topic or theme in a lot of focus to give my players a chance to really cement it into their working memory so that they can retain the concepts. So the sprint week, I, I had the players every day and there were under 16s. You guys will see the video clips today. Um, and I had them every day for one hour in our small group player development session. So the clips I'm going to show you were from five different practices. And we were building, playing against aggressive forms of pick and roll coverage from scratch. Now, don't worry if you don't know what aggressive coverage is, because I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and for me, in terms of when to teach pick and roll, I see no problem doing it at U15s, U16s, no problem whatsoever. I know a lot of coaches who feel like they need to hold back from allowing their players to experience pick and roll until they're older. For me, I just feel that's a big mistake because you look at the, the, the percent of actions in the pro game and how often pick and roll is used. And simply, it is the easiest way to create an advantage. So for me, you know, working with youth kids, I, I would not have set plays. I, I would just play pick and roll very conceptually uh, out of different uh, spacing alignments, which we get into. But then the whole thing is focused on reading the coverage. And the coverage means the way the defense defends the pick and roll. So what we look at with aggressive coverage, as I share my screen right here, is we have three types of aggressive coverage. And this is the worksheet, which I gave the players during, uh, during last week. So they all received this worksheet when we're working on something, we'll unpack this. And these right here, of the three forms of aggressive pick and roll coverage that you're gonna hear me speaking about tonight. Blitz, and you can see I've got our colors in here because we, we color coded them so that we could use these in our defense as well. So it's not just the offense. So our blitz, a blitz is a trap, a hard show and a flat show. So I'm just gonna show some video of that now so that we can all be on exactly the same page. Oh, one. And I think in Europe in particular, 
it's very important to do aggressive coverages because it's used way more here, in, our, in my opinion, and just from watching games, than conservative coverages. And a conservative coverage is something like a drop, or so an ice, anything where the screen is defended is below the level of the screen. So as I play this, we are going to see here the first aggressive coverage from Fenerbahce. So anything where the screen as defender is above the level of the screen is aggressive. So it could also be a switch, but I will, I typically do switching as a separate thing because it's very complex and there's a lot more we need to go into. So this right here is more of a flat show. Okay. And then he's recovering right there. Now here, Anadolu were prisoners of that coverage. They weren't able to create an advantage off this first one. And that happens. It's totally normal. So they're prisoners of the coverage. They didn't have a coverage solution to beat that coverage. Now they're into a second pick and roll. He flips the pick. And this is a technique used typically to soften forms of aggressive coverage. And now that is more of an aggressive, a hard show and recover. It's not flat. He's above really above that level of the screen. It's more aggressive, almost like a trap, and then recovers. And again, right there, boom. So that's just to show you guys what this, these defensive coverages look like. But the focus today is more going to be on the offensive solutions we have when playing against those forms of coverage. So back to our worksheet. A very important term is a weapon. And I, I put this in the language of the kids or even the pros, because even Pros play Fortnite. They spend too many hours doing it, especially kids. So we talk about a weapon being a coverage solution, which is something that the offense has to use to beat whatever form of pick and roll defense they play. And for me, one of the most important things, if you're working with U16, U18, or a pro team, is to have very effective coverage solutions. Because we see even at the highest level of EuroLeague, teams are not able to consistently start dominoes and to create an advantage because they don't have good weapons or they're not skilled technically and tactically in the use of those weapons. So I divide it into weapons for the handler and weapons for the screener. And some weapons are universal. They work against all types of coverage. So for instance, a reject would also work against the conservative coverage like a drop. But some of these things would be specific only to aggressive forms of coverage. So these are the solutions we have. And when you hear me talk tonight about tags, a tag is temporary help on the roller. So let's just take this example here. And against an aggressive form of coverage, you cannot contain the pick to a 2v2 action because the screen as defender is going to be out of position and the screener is typically going to have a head start on the roll. So you have to tag and bring help from other places, which is what we're going to get into. Conservative forms of coverage, the aim is to keep the pick and roll to a 2v2 action. So a tag is very important because when we play against aggressive, we've got to look to punish tags through help. And this is actually the main reason I start with aggressive first, because it really builds skill and if you teach it the right way, your players get so skilled at other areas of the game while becoming pick and roll experts. So I'm going to do everything tonight. Everything you'll see is out of shakes, pick and roll spacing. I believe this is the most common where we have a two side front side ahead of the handler and the single side back side. You can see that and that's all relation into the direction the handler comes off the screen. So that is shakes. Elbow would be a single side front side and a two side back side. And that could also occur if this screen is flipped and the screener sets it the other way towards and it becomes elbow. And this is very important because it affects where we potentially pass to against aggressive forms of coverage, whether we pass ahead or behind. And a wing is the last type of terminology I use for my pick and roll spacing. This is when we have the empty corner. Some coaches call this a naked corner and a three side front side. So let's look at the video now.
of these weapons. And then we're going to look at how we can actually teach all of this through small sided games, etc. So first one was, of course, our reject and nothing new here. Very, very, very common knowledge where as coaches, we teach typically to look to reject the pick first if we can. That's something very common. And I also agree with that. I know Trinchieri is big on that, obviously, uh, Bayern, but always looking to reject whenever we can, especially against aggressive forms of coverage. This is even more effective than a drop because the screen as defender is nowhere near it. Against the drop coverage, this screen as defender would simply be here. So there's a chance they could be emergency switch it, known as a veer switch it. You can't do that against an aggressive. So here you can see Luca rejects. Now he punishes the help with that kick out. So that's our reject. Obviously, you can do it off the dribble or off the catch. Next one we're going to look at is a bingo. Now, a bingo is something very new. It's, uh, sorry, something much less common, but still happens. And this is when we attack the gap before the screen. So especially if, if the handler does a really good job threatening the reject, the bingo will be open. So you can see here, the defense, we know it's going to be aggressive coverage because Jokic is really up and he's getting level to step out there. So we know it's going to be some type of aggressive. This is our bingo right here when Luca goes through the gap. So that was the second weapon you saw on the sheet. We also have a split. Now, again, this is something very common. It's not something, though, for everyone. I really believe that. You have to be quite an expert handler to split but it's something I, I like to teach to everyone. Now this, what you can see here, particularly effective, Jok, uh, Jokic is late to prepare that coverage. So the split naturally occurs when the, when the aggressive coverage is compromised. And that could happen if the screener does a good job arriving alone or setting that screen maybe after coming off a screen like a ram or a wedge. So here, there's obviously space to split. If it's a good show or a good blitz, you will not have space to do it. So I teach the split conceptually more if they have the space to do it. Now in dominoes, because it's one, two, three, four against three. So it's a numerical advantage and he gets the finish at the rim. So that's our split, our third weapon. Um, now dribble over. So this is something a little different. You cannot do this against the blitz. Because against the trap, you, you simply it's going to be impossible. So to me, this dribble over is most effective against either an aggressive show, which you see here, or a flat show. So what Luca does is dribbles over the show. And now dominoes, four and three, they have to tag, but they do not tag enough here. So the main cues I talk about for the handler is the decision of whether it's clean or dirty to the roller. If the tag is not uh, committed enough, it's clean. And we want to make that pass into the roller. And these handler weapons are important because they open up passes. So by using the dribble over, it opens up. And you can notice the deception here. I sell lies. Luca's looking ahead to that corner. And then he sells that, makes that no look right there in. So that's our dribble over. I'll show you one more example here against the flat show. Right here. So here you can see flat takes two slides here. And Luca gets all the way over to the rim. So it can be done in one dribble or in a few dribbles. We also have, let's go back to our worksheet, a pullback, but I'm going to show you guys the pullbacks later. And the passes I'm going to sh also show later more in our videos. I'm just going to show you a couple now so you guys have all the theory. This is just a crash course to the theory in a few minutes. So we've got passing ahead. So if we do not have short roll here, that's a tag. They really committed to, to stopping the short roll. So I don't know if it would make sense to send it in here. So the advantage is greater by passing ahead. And I call this a bullet pass because we want to send it like a bullet. Now we're in dominoes. And this is a very common coverage solution against teams that use aggressive pick and roll. Out of Shake's pick and roll, send it ahead to the high 45 man. And now 
we've got a few potential decisions. Four decisions will exist of this pass. We can either pass it into the short roll if the closeout goes, which we can see there. And now as that pass happens, we don't want this player to wait. So it turns them a short roll into a wide roll. And as that pass is in the air, now he continues the wide roll and we get it in there. So that's one decision off that. It could be if this player go, continues the roll and this player tags, it could be an extra for a shot. It could be a skip if the weak side low man goes to tag or a shot for this player. So those are the only four decisions you would see off that pass ahead. Last two things. So those are all the handler weapons. And obviously, we'll go through this again in the video. Slips, touch screens. So we never, ever, against aggressive forms of coverage, want to make contact. And I still hear a lot of old school coaches say, make contact on every screen. Well, you don't do that against aggressive forms of coverage because the advantage exists by starting a roll. So you actually want to escape before the defender touches you of the handler. So here we see a slip and the cue we use is anytime you can see your screen as defender level or jumping out, you go. So that's our slip. You can see the advantage. He gets a head start on his defender and it's very much clean because this defender has, is really attacked. He's sucked in because of the gravity of the shooting threat. So it's an easy pass over the top. So the screener should either slip or touch screen. I'm not going to get into pops and go screens today because it would be too complex, but those are obviously two good solutions, which you could also do. And here we see a touch screen where you do make contact, but it's not long contact. It's just a touch and you get out. Now it's dirty. The low man has gone to tag. So we punish the tag through the skip. Boom. Now, I know that might feel a little bit rushed, but I want to spend more time today on the teaching. But that's all the theory. You guys can obviously come back and rewatch this to get the theory again if you'd like. Um, Razan, if we have any questions as we go through this, obviously feel free to, uh, to shout. I have a short one for, for those who, who didn't see your stuff so much. Can you explain the dominoes you, you spoke a lot about? What, what's that? Sure. In short. Yeah, absolutely. Dominoes is the moment an advantage appears offensively. An advantage could be numerical or positional. For instance, a defender giving you a lane to the rim, an open window to the rim. So it could be through a closeout or they're on your hip. So obviously a pick and roll is a great way to start dominoes. Once we have dominoes, three things have to happen to get a great shot, which in my opinion is a three or a rim finish. I do not want a mid range, especially against the, an aggressive form of pick and roll coverage. I want to lay up or a three. Three things got to happen once we have dominoes. Number one is good first touch decisions, shooting, passing, or driving within zero seconds. Number two is not allowing one defender to guard two offensive players. Number three is getting into space, out to space. That means after you drive and kick, instead of staying in the space, you're sprinting out. Is that good? Yeah, thanks. Great. Thanks, okay, so how on earth do we start teaching all of this? Well, I would not immediately start doing this on zero, on air, because it's all to do with decision-making. And you players have to develop these reads playing against live defenders. So I would start non-linear. And the first thing I would do is I'm going to show you guys this in a 4v4. And I'm actually going to take my... So you guys can hear me. All right. Razvan, can you just let me know how the audio is on this video, please? Yeah, I will do that. Too loud or okay? You'll hear some it's, music probably. It, yeah, the music. You can hear the music. Right, that's good. So I blast music during my practices really loud. So uh, you're gonna hear, you'll hear some hip hop in a sec. But we're gonna start playing non-linear four v four. The offense has to score by sending a pick and roll and the defense has to do a form of aggressive coverage. And you could start with one, i.e. a blitz. It could be a trap or you could do a show and recover. It doesn't matter. And that's just the constraint is they have to do that. Now, these guys didn't even know what that was before the session. I mean, they're good players, but I just used video to show them the examples I showed you guys. And I said, this is what you have to do on the defense. 
So now the offense is in a situation where they automatically, we, we see what they do. They're making decisions and they could come up with some really creative things before you as the coach have to step in and tell them. So constraints. So you have to go set a pick. So you can see here, that's a flat show. Offense made a really nice decision to skip because this low man went to tag. And that was a great solution. They didn't score, but fine. And it's just continuous 4v4. Again, you can see flat show. Now they make that decision to pass into the roller on the short roll. Now the corner decides to cut. Great decision out. This, this cut commanded a lot of attention. Traffic in here, so the skip, the kick out was the right decision, and it's, that's a great shot. So again, it's totally non-linear. I'm not, you know, I'm not telling them what to do on the offense. I'm guiding the defense, forcing the defense to do something. Oh, a reject, a great weapon, and a really nice dominoes. This is exactly what dominoes was here, because we have the advantage from the reject, four and three kick but it could have probably been a finish that's something i would speak about with this player that's got to be a finish for me anyway they do a good job with the extra good zero second decisions getting the three and these guys are all 15 years old um so offense keeps it and we're just playing to 12 points threes and twos flat show recover another really nice skip and they're just completely playing and you could do this non-linear start in any format, but I, I like 3v3 or 4v4. So I would typically start with that. And if the defense does not do an aggressive form of coverage, i.e. they switch or they do a drop, it's two points for the offense. So that's the only thing you have to look for as the coach. Are they doing the coverage? Now, after that, we will use some small-sided games and we will really break it down. And typically what I like going to is a 2v2. So the constraints for this, are it has to be an aggressive coverage. And I think here we did the show and recover. If the offense passes to the roller, it has to be a perfect pass. So what that means is the roller cannot move substantially to catch it. They have to catch it as they roll to the rim. Because obviously this is not totally game-like because when we use an aggressive coverage, we're relying on bringing in another defender to tag, like I mentioned. So just by playing with that constraint where the offense it only counts if the offense makes the perfect pass, makes it more realistic. The handler does not obviously have to pass. They could reject, split, dribble over, whatever. So let's watch this. So touch screen, didn't make contact, dribble over, finish. And you know it's... We're doing this from uh, 45. That's a reject. Great pocket pass. Count it. And because that was a perfect pass, obviously it counts. And I do three reps and change. And that's very important because the offense has to have time to get used to the situation. But also it, give, it makes it easier for the defense to, to, to know what their coverages are. So here you can see seals. Defender completely caught out of position and just goes back door. So didn't even need the screen. And you can see every rep is slightly different. A blitz. So this is our trap. Perfect pass, count it. And you can see I'm not teaching them how to pass because every player is different. And this point guard, he's quite, he's reasonable size and he can pass over the top. But maybe if he's against the bigger defender, he's not going to be able to do that. Now, to begin with, there's no one at the rim. But one way I load and progress this is then having another live defender. So it's a two against three with another live defender in the smile, just so there's some type of decision for this player, for this roller as they get to the rim. And what that rule on the perfect pass does is it means that they, if they do blitz or show, they have to fully commit to doing it. Because if they do a really good blitz, there's a chance they get a deflection or force an out of rhythm pass. So we'll stay on this a bit longer. So here we can see the slip, blitz right there. And again, another really nice passing solution. Doing this completely naturally. And we get the finish there. And I also apply some other constraints to this. Sometimes I say you can only finish with your weak hand. 
sometimes the pass has to be a no look. You can't look at the roller. There are loads of different constraints you can add to this. Let's just watch one more. Beautiful pocket. Okay, so that's something I would start with. A 2v2, just something like that is really nice. Now, after that, I want to refine some details. And, and it's really important, you know, we can't just play small sided stuff in 2v2s and 3v3s. I really like my 1v1s too, just because it gives them more reps. And it, it's, it's a lot more time on task, so to speak. So 1v1, I want to play both hard show and flat show here. So what I've put here is some chairs. Now chairs, they're not task specific. They're not game-like. So why am I using them? Well, it allows the players to get way more reps in this situation because one player is not the screener. So what you're going to see here is the two chairs on the 45s and the handler cannot score. They can only pass. And it's a 1v1. It's a 1v1 with the screener against the, the screener's defender. The screener's defender must do an aggressive form of coverage. And then the pass has to be clean into the roller to count. Points are awarded for the passer making a perfect pass and for the roller finishing. You can also award points to the defense if they force a stop or they recover like that and do a good wall up. That's what we emphasize defensively, getting vertical, etc. Again, if they do not do an aggressive form of coverage, you redo it so they have to commit to that coverage and then they're trying to recover. And again, you know, there's some element of perception here and this is why you can get your players finishing and developing their finishing solutions exactly at the same time as learning some advanced tactical things. Because look at this, this is a one foot layup. So for me, I would not teach something like this isolated because they can get it naturally in an environment like this. Just watch the far side, because this is quite interesting. A nice dribble over used here, dribble over to create that passing window and a nice one hand pass right there. And again, I like having two play the both sides go at the same time because it's a little bit chaotic, leads to many different finishing solutions. This would also be something where it's three reps and stay and then they rotate after. And it's the, uh, the first, uh, first player to get something like 12 points. And again, this is my big guy. He's like, I don't know, maybe 198, something like that. But again, players play everywhere. So they're not just screeners and handlers. So this is good for him to work on his game a little bit. And that's a really nice one-handed pocket. He did a really nice job on that. Let's watch the last one here. And again, if it's too easy and they don't recover, you can just add a second defender in right there. So now let's look at the flat. So that was the hard show now. And this is really good because the defense learns at the same time. I'm going to play the sound on this so you guys can hear this what, what goes on. I, that was a good effort. Yes. Good effort. Good effort. Good recovery. Good re so let's see that. Great one. D, Andretta. Okay, so that was a good effort. I was just there re-emphasizing, you know, for the defense to, to flat show and recover in front, that requires a lot of effort. So obviously I was praising that. That's very important. Yes, good effort, good effort, good recovery, good recovery. Come on, guys, 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 guys. Skip. Okay, right here, flat show. That's a good example. Nice one hand pocket. Now, this is really important. Getting them to play until the defense gets the ball. A lot of the time, players give up on the first shot. They have to keep play, playing play. and be in a position to, to get the rebound and go straight up for that putback. Good, Bonji. You can see just every finish here is different. So they're getting in their pick and roll solutions, their defense, and finishing at the same yes. time. Last one. Step back, I gotta hear the coverage, my friend. Okay. So something else I do during that is I get them the defense just to say the color of the coverage. So for instance, you saw red, if we go back to this. So black is our hard show. 
So I'd get them to say black, black as the defense that does it. The flat show, I get them to say green twice, just so it builds the habit of communicating, giving the coverage early. Um, so let's look now at some other things we can do to build some of these weapons. So 1v1, what we've got here is this is something I would do for warm up. And it's not like, uh, maybe, yeah, this one was live. So what it is, is he, this defender here is stimulating the flat show. Now it's scripted. There is no decision making. So when I'm doing these, I would show them the videos that we saw at the start of today. I either dribble over and I'd be more explicit. This is what we are working on. So this was a warm up from one of those sessions. So the first rep is flat show, dribble over, and the, we talk here about getting as many steps in one dribble. So the, the external cue is I want you to float with the ball. Now it's a push out and I want them to complete this whole weapon in two dribbles. So they dribble over with one and then use a push out dribble to get downhill. So I don't need to teach this because all I say is you have two dribbles to get this done on your dribble over, two dribbles to get this done. And the defense can play live after they give the over. So they've got to give the flat show to allow the offense to use the over, but then they can go totally live. And again, using chairs here, it just allows more time on task. There are more reps than having one player be the screener. And I always change location too, so that they get the finish from a different angle and obviously work both hands. So there you see it, flat show, that's a good dribble over. Now he comes back, loses it, fine. That's exactly what learning looks like. So this is an example of something scripted where we're always doing the same thing and that defender is stimulating the flat show and we just work on our overs. So you can pick whatever it is you feel is the most important weapon. Whatever it is you, you feel your players really, really need to get. Vazvan, any questions? Um, for now, not. Okay, great. So I would also do something like this 1v1. Let me just see. I think I have it on here. Okay, great. So this was our warm up for the last practice we had, the fifth session of our sprint. Now, this one's a little bit different. This is an example of something called serial block practice. This is not decision-making, this is scripted, but for four reps, the defense is gonna give something different to the handler every time to work on all their weapons against aggressive coverages. So rep one, the defender is gonna allow the offense to reject. So you can see here, they allow them to reject and they're not live, but they're scripted. I want them to try and wall up just so that the offense gets some type of finish. And you can see that they miss, miss both layups because it's not completely live, but at least there's some element of pressure there. It's game-like, right? So rep number one, and it's stay for four reps. Nep, rep number one is give a reject, the most important weapon. Rep number two is give a bingo. So you can see here, he attacks before the screen. If you remember that bingo clip we saw of Luka Doncic, and it's exactly the same thing on the finish. Here's a really nice example. There they go into the bingo. Rep number three is a split. So now the defender, move, the first two reps, we simulated being the handler's defender. Now for rep three and four, we become the screener's defender. And the, as we show, we're going to leave a gap for the split, but try and steal a ball, which is realistic because now the offense has to avoid that defender reaching. And this is why I would never do this one on zero because it is completely not realistic. Just by having a defender here, even though they're not live, it stimulates what will happen in the game much better. So there we can see some splits and look how creative this is. Now, sometimes what I would do is only work on the splits if they find it really difficult. So if I see them all, all just because I want to work on it. So it would be three reps only split but I would say split it a different way every time. So let's say they cross it over once, maybe the second time they do something super creative like that through the legs. 
you know, for 15 years old, for the first time they're doing this, it's pretty good. And I don't care about the finishes for now because the focus is on this stuff. And again, I'd also do that for the rejects. Say we do three rejects. Can you reject it using a different technique every time? So I'm not teaching anything technical other than using as few dribbles as possible to get it done. And rep four is a dribble over. So don't allow the split, dribble over, and look how nice that push out is. But again, you know, because they're going at the same time, they've got to have vision and figure out timing and how to uh, dribble over in a way that avoids the other guys that are playing at the same time as them. So we'll just watch this, watch a few examples. Now, there are too many dribbles. So this is why doing these weapons in as few dribbles as possible can, is, is essential and you can just apply task constraints. Now, to begin with, I didn't constrain the number of dribbles because I wanted them just to focus on this because it was new, but then we spoke about it. And you can see that player doing it really well, throwing the ball out. And it's just it's so important for separation. Again, you can see another one, nice one there. Let me play some sound now. At the rotation. This is totally uh, live, this is unedited. So it gives you a good idea of what practices look like. So that's, this is our warm up. So now after that, when we go more live and we just introduce more loads, gradually. beautiful finishes. <laughs> Guys, is Andretta getting in with you? So that is just something great I would use as a warm up to teach so to speak, or develop some of these weapons. Now, live 1v1s, critical for the handler. So here you can see an example of a dynamic start I use. A static start would be what you saw in the last small side of game, where the handler and defender are already in perfect positioning at the 45. This is dynamic because they're going to start somewhere different to where they run the pick from, which is better for retention. So we're going to start this off a zipper entry off an inbound. So again, the zipper's new. I wasn't really teaching it because I just wanted to use it to get into the pick and roll. So now it provides different affordances off the catch. So it's zipper into pick and roll if you need it. But the rules were, if you reject, you get four points if you reject and score. If you bingo, you get three points. The defense cannot go under, so they have to go over. So if you cannot reject or bingo and you go over and you score, you get two. So it's four, three, or two. Now, what you can see here is it's actually, I think this is a travel. Let's see what his pivot foot is. Yeah, he changes pivot foot. So this is great because now we're naturally working on footwork and pivoting at the same time. And you can see it was probably a moving screen. But the reality of learning is learning is messy. And gradually you're going to see, look, now next rep, he's got it. A beautiful jab off the catch, which sets up his reject. He can't do it, however. He can't reject because the defense gets there. But now it's a good setup, and now he can use the screen. So the worst thing, the very worst thing, if they reject and cannot get it, they've at least done a good setup. And now they're going to be in a good position to use the screen. Now here, I'd probably talk about left window to finish, defenders on his right shoulder, but working memory, I don't want to overload him. I just want to focus on the pick and roll weapons because that's the most important thing right now in this activity. Alex, we have two questions. Go so far away. So the first one, uh, um, I would like to, to ask you, what is, how would you, teach it uh, you said one v one then go to two v two or you go from five versus five to four versus four and and so on so do you go let's say this schematic one one or do you mix it and um, cool. why why would you teach it like like you you, so, you want to teach it so i would go four v four first probably maybe three v three but four v four possible so i understand the context of the situation that's really important. I'm not going to teach the hand the weapon straight away because they don't understand the whole picture. So I'm going to start with the 4v4. I'll start with the game and let them experience that. After that, I will probably go to something like a, if I do 4v4, probably a 3v3 and then a 2v2. Then from that, 1v1. So it's the, 
this is the complete opposite to what most coaches talk about with progressions and all this crap. But it's it's how players learn best. And it's they understand the picture and then we can refine it and we actually see as the coach what it is they need the most. Because for instance, you know, I don't know the players and I don't know the team, but say, I think a lot of the time as coaches, we have this perfect idea of how to teach something in our heads. But what if the team doesn't need that? What if they can already do it really well? So the advantage of doing something 4v4 is you can see what they need when it comes on to other things. And if they discover some good solutions, you can reconnect the things you're working on to what they did in that game. For instance, when we saw that reject in the 4v4 with my player, Andrea, when we did it with those weapons, with the, with the scripted 1v1 you just saw, I'd be like, all right, guys, we're going to use this to work on our rejects. Andrea, you did a really good reject when we played our 4v4. This is why it's really important we work on the reject, so to speak. So when, if I understand right, you, you let them uh, make their own decision, see what they can do, yes. then break it up. And if, if you see there, there is something to do, then you start 1v1 and 2v2 and, yes. and build it up. Exactly. And I, I, the 1v1 and 2v2 is important, Razvan, because you know, even pro guys are probably not going to have good weapons with like dribble overs, pullbacks, splits. So it's important to give them experience of it. Um, but after they at least understand the situation and how it can be useful to them when playing against an aggressive form of coverage. Thanks a lot. Uh, Stanley has a question. Stanley, hey, you Dan. should. Yeah. Hey, Alex. Um, I was wondering, uh, talking about the reject or the split, which do require some sort of uh, technical capability. Um, You said something along the lines, I don't give technical instruction right now. Yes. I just give them a constraint and then they, they just work their way out of it themselves. Yes. But what about players that lack the imagination, for example, or simply don't have the tools to, you know, do what you, what you envision them to do? Sure. So what I do is do this 1v1, which you're seeing here, but I wouldn't do it off the zipper. I just have the screener right here, the handler. So handler, their defender screener, just static, start. And all I would say is play 1v1. If you reject, same as the points for this, if you reject, and I'd show them what the reject is if they don't know it using the video. And I'll demonstrate and I'll say, if you are able to do this, you get double points. If you can't reject, you have to use the screen, you only get two. And I, even you would be very surprised even with players who do not have like a good foundation like these guys, they will figure some stuff out. Then if they really can't do it and you see a technique problem, like they just simply can't reject, then I would go to that one-on-one -on -one scripted with the chairs you saw where the defender is just guiding the offense. They're not live. And they're just giving them a situation to reject. And then light pressure maybe might poke at the ball, but just giving the offense more technical use of using the reject that's exactly how i do do it in a situation like that so it also comes back to the point rosman just uh, just asked of showing the bigger picture yes. and if you can't yeah. do it you go back and back and back a step exactly you got to do that first yeah yeah absolutely makes sense all right cool and i know this is you won't find this in any coach manual or or like you know a lot like here in italy i know the federation courses would uh would say that this approach is the wrong way but to be honest it's the one which aligns most with motor science and how players learn best and it, it means that i know it's totally different as a coach and it's but if you try it it's you'll really see the see the results um yeah razan was there one more question I think the one is, is already answered. Uh, uh, can I, I'm going to get through this because I got so much more to share, if that's cool. I, I, I want to, you know, give, give coaches as much as possible today. Um, so continuing here, now the screen has flipped it. So they flip the screening angle. Really good reject there. So this would be worth four if he makes it, which he does. 
So that's an example of a 1v1 plus one. Okay, let's dive into some more. Uh, and I'll show you how I would use a one on zero because that's also very important. Now, what, what we've seen so far is we've seen this 2v1 zipper start. We've seen these two. I would go back after doing something like what we just saw, then to a 2v2. This, I'm not going to play it again because we've seen it. So I would jump around and now see if they can do the exact same small-sided game, which they already know, but see if they can have more success with it. So again, this is something I would jump around a lot. So maybe we do a 2v2, then we go to a, uh, a 1v1 plus one, like we just saw, then a 2v2 again. Then we do maybe a 1v1, I don't know. So it's allowing the players to show and demonstrate any understanding that they have. So we've looked, that's everything today in terms of weapons for the handler. Now we're going to look a little bit more at the passing options that we have. Because this, this is really, really important, especially playing against the tags, which you know are going to happen um, against these types of coverage. Let me just see if it's this one. Okay, so I want to come back to that. 3v2. We've got set up for this. No defender on the handler. The only two defenders are... Uh, single backside corner and screen is defender. 3v2, but the handler cannot score. These are the constraints. So this is out of our shakes pick and roll spacing, which we looked at with the single side backside. So my thought process would be, I would start with these, teaching these weapons like we saw in those 1v1s. And naturally in the 2v2, the slips and touch screens happen anyway, because the, the screeners figure out that you don't want, don't, don't want to make contact. My first kind of traditional progression, so to speak, would be adding in the backside. So we're playing in this part of the floor. And this is really important against aggressive forms of coverage because so often the handler becomes fixated and they only look at the screener and the screener's defender. And when you see these tags in aggressive forms of coverage, they have to be able to see everything. So what we're going to look at, uh, we'll just dive into the theory and then how, how we teach it. So on the shakes pick and roll, if there's a single side tag, i.e. the tag comes from the single, we've got three main decisions. If the tag is up and the tag tags towards the roller, the corner should hold to lengthen the closeout. And it's a pass straight to the corner for a short, or maybe a pass into the roll if they start recovering. That's the tag up. Tag in is when we lift. So if the tag goes into the paint, then it's dribble, throw back. And this is where those weapons are so important because if the players use things like dribble overs, it makes the pass way easier or something like a pullback against the blitz. And obviously if there is no tag and no one helps the roll, it's clean and we pass it into the roll. So those are the three theory items. How do we teach it? So this 3v2 is a great way to do that. Roll, tag up. So he holds. Now relay pass into the roller. That should have been a finish. He faked. He had an open window. But again, focus right now is just on these decisions. And again, this would be stay for three reps. So they get to experience some success and the passer can get weapons if they make nice passes, which are perfectly in rhythm. Now, something here, I didn't speak about it because of the overload on working memory. Off the single side, if the roller does not get the ball and it goes back, they should look to seal the recovery. That's technically another weapon. So this, if he hasn't got the ball by now, he should start to seal here just to prevent this defender being able to steal the entry and just maintain the advantage even more. Because obviously here, this is not good. We've lost the advantage and that's the worst shot we can get. So this would actually be minus one. If players take a mid range, when we're playing against the aggressive form of coverage, I give them minus one. Because it means they didn't use an appropriate weapon to, to get a bigger advantage shot. 
And again, you can see technique wise, they didn't get it there. Reality of learning. Now, what I would do here, obviously I clipped these really quickly, is I would guide, use a guided defense, this defender, and I would give them an A, B, and a C so that the offense always gets a different decision. So our A, let's go back to our worksheet. Our A, option A, would be X2 is gonna tag up. Option B is X2 will tag in. And option C, X, XT, X2 will not tag. So what that is doing is creating repetition, repetition. Offense has to read the situation and they give any letter for the three reps. So it could be CAB, BAC, whatever. So I'd use guided defense sometimes to trick them I'd say do re repeat one letter twice. So it's like a tag up A and then give two Bs, tag in, just so they don't know what, what's coming as that last one. Uh, so that's an example of a uh, 3B2. Now we're gonna look at this again. Constraints here were making a no look pass. So this is an example of a limiting constraint where we, we don't talk about the technique, we let it happen, but just by saying it's gotta be a no look, they naturally do a different no look pass every time. So here, yeah. that was a great decision because the tag started recovering, so it's clean. Yes, Andrea. Okay. Made the right decision, pass into the role. And we had a bit of a laugh because he's, uh, he's normally the, the guy that only sets screens. Great decision there. That's an okay read. Again, they have to play it out until the defense gets the ball. So this is the same 3v2. We just added a limiting constraint of setting a no look. Now I'm adding a coach in, so they have to screen the coach. And he's, he can do a, a light coverage. And this is a new decision. This would be an option D. This is a whip it pass where if you see a low defender going into tag or over help, we do not even use the screen. We just whip it, get the ball there quickly to start dominoes. And that's obviously a big advantage shot right now that we have. So that could be an option D if you want to guide it. Okay. Obviously next steps from that would be tags playing 3v3 without a 3v2. And again, this is 3v3 here. So the setup we have is 2v2 here, and we've taken away that corner offensive defense and on the weak side. And now they're playing here. Again, this is not totally realistic because obviously totally realistic would mean playing 5v5, but it gives the offense a chance to experience the same similar perceptual cues that they would have in a game. And obviously that's a nice decision there to the roller. When we talk about our clean or dirty, that was definitely clean. Now, uh, that's also clean. And now on the next one, you're gonna see, I think this one is the dirty. Nope, this is a short roll ghost. So now what you see is different to the previous two reps. Now the low man does actually go across to help. This now triggers dominoes, our dominoes principles, which is a corner ghost. So it's short roll into corner ghost to punish the low man helping. And that's obviously a really nice solution. I'm just gonna play some more clips on this topic. I think it's here. One sec. All right, ignore, I'm gonna come on to that one after. Okay, so when we're playing with the weak side tags, I did a whole thread on my Twitter. In fact, let's do it quickly now. So um, I haven't showed any of the same videos from today in there, because I know some of you guys obviously will probably follow us on Twitter. But if you like some of these ideas, you can go check it out. And I did a whole thread of like 10 tweets on this whole topic. And this is all from the 3v3. So 
this was another day when I did it, and I'm just playing this clip because that was obviously a different decision there we saw. It's sorry, apologies for the quality. I'm just gonna try it again. So you can see, this is the dirty. This is why I wanted to show it. We went to tag and now we have to throw it ahead. That's our clean. And you can see there, really good examples of the handler weapons being used to make those passes easier. So on this next one, see this dribble over. And that really allows that pass into the roller to be clean and then the reject. So when we look at the technical skill to make those skip passes, if there's a tag, that is an example of something difficult. But again, the game reveals the problem. So if you can see in the 3v3 that players cannot make a skip to that weak side corner, that is when I would have no problem doing something like 1v0 or 1v1. So what you can see here now is go, this go. is a situation I would use just to give the hand of some success making these skip passes so that when we go back to the 3v3, they feel confident enough to do it. So we've got defender here. I'm just giving some type of show, aggressive or flat. And this is a burst. So the passes and the shooters stay for 45 seconds. If it's a clean pass straight to the shot pocket, the receiver shouts yes, and the passer gets a point. If the shooter makes the shot, they also get a point. So they would do multiple, four different rotations from each spot on both sides. And the player with the most points after is the winner. So you can see they rebound, pass it back, and they're staying in the same spots. He's, got, he's a little bit unsure. He's got to be sprinting back there. But it just gives them lots of time on task. So they can get lots of reps just getting comfortable with making these passes. Because it's not easy to make these one-handed. It's, it's, you know, and it's, for me, it's, really, it's a really important skill. Especially on the left hand, a lot of pros can't even make that pass. So obviously, if you can start doing this with U16s now, they will have a ridiculous advantage if they ever do become pro players. So that's something that I would use once we've obviously seen the problem and we've seen what they can do in the 3v3. Let's go. Now, yeah, tag reads. Again, this is something I would do to develop confidence reading the single side tag. So let's say that when we were doing our shakes, pick and roll, where we had the single side filled, I'm not going to play it again, but the problem is obviously going to be this low man reading their tag. And what you'll see most of the time is this player in the corner is only looking at the ball and they never actually read their defender. So this is a low order activity. It's not completely game-like, but it's just to emphasize that the decisions they have. And I'm very explicit with this in terms of if I tag in, it must be a shake up, a lift. If I tag up, you must stay because that is explicit info that's very specific. And I'm very particular with that because it affects our ability to create a good advantage. And again, this would be something I do for a burst. So yeah, they're getting passing and shooting and at the same time, but it all links into our tactical concepts. And there you can see, I went deep help. So whip it, don't even use the screen. You could obviously add another guided defender here if you wish to. All right, so obviously I'm showing a bunch of stuff getting through it. Let's, I think we played this one already. Yeah. Okay, last two videos. Now, this is our shape spacing single side field. So now some of those reads you just saw in that low order video, I'm hoping are retained in this 3v3 when we go back to it. So again, nice decision there on the skip. And it's continuous. So what you can see here to accomplish high time and task, I have a second ball ready. So after the first one, I'm immediately throwing the second ball in an offense and defense state. They've just got to get that ball out. Someone else will pick it up. So they get two quick reps, time on task, and then they rotate after. So again, just exploring unique ways you can do it. Sometimes what I also do is a 3v3 first, and then the second ball is a 2v2. 
So it depends, whatever it is I want to work on, whatever it is I want to emphasize, obviously you, you, you have to know what, what it is your players need. Throwback decision, should have taken the first shot without the fake. But again, all these decisions and perceptions are being worked on. Now in a different location, this is more the elbow pick and roll that we looked at at the start, playing it out. All completely live. Okay. I want to see. Now, last video is, I just want to show how all the things I've shown tonight are retained in some of our small-sided stuff. So let's start. Rejects. And as you do this, you're going to see how every technique is different every time. So this is why it makes no sense to me to teach all these things very explicitly one on zero. When I do one on zero, like you saw the passes, as long as the ball gets there successfully, I don't care what technique is used. Now, obviously, if there's a technique deficiency and something is holding them back from accomplishing that task, then I will step in. But you can see here, every reject, slightly different every time. Now, what you can hear here is some arena music and playing over. So it's a little bit more stressful, the environment. And it also means they have to defense. The, the rule in this 3v3 is, like I said at the beginning, it's got to be red, green, or black. Blitz, aggressive show, or flat show. If they don't connect and they don't show it, it's instantly two points for the offense. So just having that music makes it harder and they're really forced to communicate. I'm not going to go into today what the, screw, what the roller should do on a reject, but you can see a good example there of what we talk about rolling, finding the window. Obviously, that was a really nice pocket, some nice creativity emerging. So those are our rejects. All our clean decisions. So again, clean means when there is no tag on the roller. And here you can see, I think this was a really nice pullback. Yeah, that's what I call a pullback, where you just get as much space as you can instead of the dribble over, going laterally, you're just going backwards. And again, what a beautiful one-hand pass off the dribble. Dribble over, again, creativity. Look how he wraps, wraps that around. I'm not teaching that. It just emerged naturally through all this small sided stuff. Another nice dribble over. Another great ghost cut. Missed it, but it was a really nice, uh, nice play. Touch screen here, which we spoke about. Never want to hold that contact against the aggressive coverage. And that's a nice finish. I, I don't teach in absolutes. So even if they come across to help, if it's a really good finisher or we have a size advantage, I would always like to get that finish because it's higher, it's more efficient. And there's obviously a chance you can get fouled and head to the line. Again, dribble over. Now look how this passing option is different. Instead of over, he can't do that because the defender, so he goes, instead of around, he goes over the top. Beautiful read. Now our dirties. So these were when it wasn't clean. So tag, third of the tag there. If he throws it in, he's potentially in a difficult position on the catch because of this guy. So it's a throw ahead. He should be sealing here, which he does, which is good. So now he's in favorable position for the box out, for the shot. Touch screen, pass in, pass over. Now again, in 5v5, it's, it's going to be harder than that because we have defenders rotating, but the three on three is a great way to introduce it to them. So this was our blitz here. Offense does a good job getting over it. Now, really in dominoes, he's having to try and guard two. And that's a great no look for this guy's attack. Now, obviously, he didn't get the pass, but I like, I would encourage the no look there because it's important. And it really, at the next level, you have to have that to deceive tags because guys are so quick and closing out. Now, applying constraints. Because 3v3 is not as optimal as 5v5, I do apply some task constraints to make it more realistic. Now here, if the ball was not delivered straight to the corner, it would be a turnover. So here this player started to lift, but he shouldn't lift because there's gonna be a player there on the two side in the 45. 
So the options, I, I added these constraints where you had to hold corner or ghost cut. So if the ball does not go straight to corner and the receiver has to go in to catch it, it's a turnover. So that means the ball has to go straight to where it would when they're playing in the 5v5. Now, this is a completely live, live small-sided game. It's complete. And you can see this player here is complaining. There was a call he didn't like. So I, I give him a technical foul. And it's so important to have these competes because the guys here, they're, I mean, obviously they're 15 years old, but they compete like crazy. And I really believe if, if, you, wanna, if you have a prospect and you want to develop them, competitiveness is essential. So this is just one way we do it. Um, so we compete in a lot of the small-sided games you saw today. We would compete. Um, now, what you have seen here is where the defense did not give one of those coverages, one of the aggressive coverages. This, to me, is a, is a up-to-touch drop because the screen is defender is below level of the screen. So you can see there, all I said was hold. Two points offense wasn't aggressive coverage. So it's constraining... The defense, so the offense have a chance to work on all these solutions that we've looked at. See this one again. Again, he was in a drop. So two points offense without doing anything. Same thing here. Now he's not even an up to touch drop. He's in a medium drop. And this is why it's so good for their concentration because we're learning at the same time. Now on the 16 team, has like five different pick and roll coverages because I'm teaching them how to beat it offensively. Too late, so again, that would count. Now, as you do this, it's very important too to coach the defense. Do not just coach the offense because better defense will make for better offense. So you can see here, just being small things like being disruptive on a blitz is critical. We want the defense to be good so that the offense is forced into making better solutions. And again, on the, he tried to split there. Probably, I don't know if he had that. Maybe he could have, but by being disruptive and teaching players to get their hands in those windows, it obviously makes the offense better. This one is a big one to me. Key KPI, key performance indicator for any aggressive coverage. As the screen is defender recovers, they've got to get big with their hands to take away any potential pocket passes because they're essentially blind. They can't see the passer. So it's really important just that they run with their hands out just to disrupt any potential pockets. That might exist. There you can see a great glitch. You can see really getting into it on the compete there. Definitely got to encourage defense like this. All right. Last thing I just want to show, uh, mistakes. Because when you coach with this, if you use some of the small-sided games I've shared today, the mistakes are going to be, they're going to be prominent. You're going to see them a lot. And these are pretty good players. I mean, we've got three national team kids here, either from Italy or other countries, you know, on the 16s group. But... <laughs> Things like that are going to be totally normal. And it's good if you see these. It's good because that is obviously a dirty decision. That's an obvious tag. There's a player here. But it shows that the thing, it shows what your players need. And it shows it's a good level for them. If the problem with all these traditional drills is players never make mistakes and it's simply too easy. So if you see mistakes as you do some of the small side of games, it's a great thing. Now, last thing I'll leave you with tonight, on all these compete drills, it has to finish validating free throws. And this is just something fun. The guys really enjoy it. So say it's a 3v3, the winning team only wins if they make five of six free throws. So say they get to 12 points, they've got to win by getting five of six as a team. So each player shoots two. If they miss, they reset to six points. And the other team obviously has a chance to get to 12 before them. We keep playing. So the rules we have in our practice are 
the other team can distract the offense as they shoot their free throws however they like. They can say whatever they want. So I hear some pretty funny things too. The only thing they cannot do is touch the player that shoots their free throws. So it's just something fun we do. It's just part of our practice culture. But it's, and obviously I have this annoying music at the same time, but it's, it's a really nice way just to finish. And you can see here, they'd made something like four or five. So this is like the most important one. And they're really getting into it and he makes it. So now the other team would get something like 10 push-ups or whatever. Um, okay, I've gone through that really quickly, I know. Oh, most important, then finish with the 4v4. So exactly what I showed you at the start, then we end with the game. So obviously if I had 10 players, I would do this 5v5 with the same constraints. And now obviously getting them to read both single side and two side. Good, that's like a complete crash course on uh, aggressive coverage in not much time. But I uh, hope that helps, Razvan. For sure it does. We have also a lot of questions. So, Stefan, you're... Yeah, we've, we have first a question in the, in the chat um, there. What about action on weak side, like exchange or off-ball screens um, to create more option beside all than the weapons? I think that would be the next step. What, what do you think about that, Alex? Yeah, so it's, again, it's just the challenge of facing the, the working memory. What can the players remember before it becomes way too much? Um, so for me, over I'm going to continue to solidify this stuff over the next month and I'm not going to talk about anything on the weak side other than being in optimal spacing which is four, 45 stretched so beyond the three point line and corner and making a ghost cut occasionally from the corner especially on the short roll that's the only weak side stuff because I want the focus, focus to be on the more important stuff and also against aggressive forms of coverage with the tags, I see a value more to holding than exchanging because that skip pass could come at any time and I don't want them to not be available for it. So um, I would focus more on holding spots and ghost cuts at the right time. Even if I had a pro team, I'd, I'd still do that because I think we can still get open high value shots if we pick the right weapons that's a great question though against drop coverages i would do a lot more off ball because i find the off ball players and drops tend to fall asleep so that's when i'd run stuff like blind flares and ghosts and exchanges it's a good great question the next one is from ricardo ricardo you're you're up um, yeah. Hi, Alex. Um, hey, Ricardo. How you doing, man? Very good. <laughs> awesome presentation. I love it. Um, I wanted to ask you about. So I have the the problem with the that I don't have enough players to run the situation that we are talking about yeah. with the tags. I don't have the six guys, so I have the three, for example. And then where where should I put the? Uh, where do you think is more? Uh, better to put the the doomy defense so the the, okay. the dumb right. defense how many Ricardo, three players or six players three players okay three players. and i want to run that that tag situation no worries right. so what i would do is do the single side tag mm -hmm. which do with the yeah. stuff with that then as they play their 1v1s move about the court randomly either on the strong side corner or the weak side and sometimes just do this mm -hmm. So what that's going to develop is obviously it's not as optimal as having more players, but you can at least develop the habit of having the hand that looking, because this is the most important thing against aggressive coverage, the hand that has to look with their eyes and actually see the whole floor. So if you, for instance, just play, say you did that one V one plus one, which we showed, right. With mm -hmm. the yeah. zipper, then you can move around. And if you put your hands up, they've got to pass you the ball, then get open, receive it again and score. So at least then they're going to get used to having their eyes up and making some of those passes, even though the decision isn't the same as with the tag, you can at least work on more of the technical habit, which is better than doing nothing, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but necessarily to specific the tag has to be with more numbers. Yes, exactly. Okay, good. It just has to be. And you know, 
even even maybe you being the handler sometimes to put the players in different situations. And then it gives me an extra guy, yeah. Yeah, you just have to think like think like that in different situations. Exactly. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Pleasure. Okay, the next question is from Maxi Deinhardt. Maxi, please. Yeah. Hello, Alex. Um, Hi, you worked with a lot of video clips and you said better defense creates better offense. And you showed us the clips with Luka Doncic. How often do you show your players clips and do you also focus on defense and also you showed us a, 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 yes. a lot of clips yes. from your players do you show your players the clips from themselves also okay top question so to begin with when you guys saw the 4v4 i would only show the clips of the defense and what i would do is pick a defense which was successful where the offense didn't have a good solution on purpose And it would only be like one or two clips max. And that is literally, I do that on the court. So they see it and then they do it. And then maybe they see it again to remember. So I would just find like in this example, I'd have like one really good blitz, one really good aggressive show, one really good flat show. Um, and I would only show them that to begin with. Then when we go on to the other small sided stuff, that's when I'm going to start to show them the, like the Luca clips you saw. But as I do it, I say, this is not the only way to do this weapon. I'm just, for instance, a reject. So I'm like, this is the idea of the reject, but I want you to explore different ways of doing this. Um, and again, it would be one or two videos at a time. So maximum, the video session would be like three minutes tops because it's also done on the court. And I typically do it as they get their water. So as they're drinking their water to save time, I've already got my laptop there with the clips and I'm like, all right, this is what we're doing next. Say that thing with the chairs, with the scripted defense where we had the weapons, like the reject bingo over split to begin with. I obviously wouldn't do a four at once. I'd just pick one or two and then I'd show them the clips for whatever those weapons were. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Cool. So and the sheet, like you, you also showed us the sheet with the weapons. Do you give that sheet your players or? At the end. At, at the end, way. okay. Not at the start. So they first oh, yeah. need to figure out and after that. Yes. So I would give it at the end and then I test them on it. So they get a test of me in English. It's either like multi-choice or whatever. Or Kahoot. It's funny. Okay. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. So Alex, uh, another question, um, if maybe for to sum up a little bit. Um, the the thing is, it's always difficult as a coach to uh, go just for three or the main five tricks you have. But uh, if you are a new under 15 coach and you go with a new team, what would be your main three or five things to uh, to teach the pick and roll? Okay, so. Mm. Pick the coverage first, and I would start with aggressive coverage because I do. So, my order of priorities is going to be aggressive coverage first, then switching, then drop coverages because the tools you get from aggressive, you, you just become better players out of it because it involves everyone, it involves the whole team. Whereas a drop could just be two players. Also, even though the aim of a drop is to contain it to 2v2, because players will be used to that passing and reading the defense from playing against aggressive forms of coverage, they naturally still do that against the drop. So when players off the ball fall asleep or tag unnecessarily, they will be able to make those passes. Whereas if you go with the drop immediately, I think it's harder to then have that vision looking at the whole court. Also for the defense, I think it's easier to go from aggressive to passive than passive to aggressive. Um, so keys to me with a pick and roll would be pick the coverage clearly that you want to start with. And it's it all has to be based pick and roll how you beat that coverage. It's I see a lot of times teams 
and coaches maybe talk about pick and roll without actually being clear as to what the aim of it is and what the aim of the coverage is and how to beat that coverage. So to me, it is totally dependent on that. I think then being simple with the weapons to not do too much. So like our under 16s team, we're probably the best team in Italy and they are able to take on a lot because they do the best players I have twice a day, like three, four days a week. And even though it's like a short session, 45 minutes, I can do all the weapons you guys saw today. I can do that. And that's probably enough for a pro team as well. If I had a youth team where I only had three practices a week, I would really scale down on the weapons. So less is more when it comes to picking your coverage solutions. So maybe today I would only pick a reject, a dribble over and the passes. If I just had three team practices a week and instead of doing all three types of aggressive coverage, maybe we start only with the hard show. So it's really important to get those priorities straight. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that what there were all the questions for now. We, we, we can wait, wait one minute. So if somebody has one or two questions uh, left, then, then we could. Mark I'll, throw, okay. I'll throw one in there. Come hey. on. Hey, Alex. Sorry, I, I bumped in halfway. So um, I might ask a question you already answered at the start. Cool. Um, but um, my question is more a general, general one. Um, how much pick and roll would you practice overall? Like, Great question, Marcus. Compared to all the other stuff. A lot. Because I, I think you build so much skill out of it. Like we talk, like the kids doing so much on those on those videos in terms of dribbles, passing, off ball reactions, finishes, shots. So for me, I I would do it quite a lot with a U16 and 18 team because I think if it's done the right way with these small sided things, it's effective. The problem to me is when it's not done the right way and there's like none of the decisions are spoken about and it's just, that's when it's a bit like, mm. or what you see a lot in youth basketball where you just have the same players every single time handling and screening and they're just looking for the same outcome every time, turning the corner drive. That's not pick and roll to me. It's just. Okay, cool. so that's a really cool point. So you'd make sure that uh, different players within your team would be the ball handlers and the screeners oh, and not always that's the same. That's actually a constraint, Marcus. In the yeah. game, I forgot to mention it. Yeah. It had to be a different combo every time as the handler and the screener. Okay. So they'd have to get their point. They'd all be rotating, even the bigs handling and smalls setting screens. Because also that's for any pro coaches on. If I was coaching in Europe, I would set so many small big screens and have the bigs handling. No one really does it here, but it's like no one, no one would know how to defend it because bigs mm. are simply never put in situations where they have to defend the ball and smalls do not defend the screener. Mm. So if you could do that with youth players, wow. Yeah. yeah. And the other big uh, lead, sort of leading on from that question is another topic that's often discussed is when do you start introducing pick and roll? So yeah. should it be done in under 14s, for example? Or do you have an opinion in that? Yes. In that space? I, I would only do it with under 14s, Marcus, if I had an incredible group where we had probably like five practices a week and their spacing, maybe I had them from under 12s and or under 13s. And we'd been able to do all the spacing, all the dynamic one-on-one, cutting, transition. All the dominoes. Then, yeah. So I think if I, if maybe I could have a team for two seasons, maybe. And even then I would do a get action before an actual pick because it opens up more dynamic one-on-one -on -one and cuts. So that's quite a long checklist to get through of things. So I think there's probably a very small chance that we'd simply have time to do all that well in under 14s before we come onto it. Even in under 15s, I would want them to have that stuff down before we actually get to the ball screen. I would not want though to introduce it any later than under 16s because then you're just handicapping them. And I, all the time here in Italy, like I know a lot of coaches even have seen the stuff I've been sharing recently and being like, oh, why are you doing so much pick and roll? It's like these players are going to go to the, if it's on, will go to the Euro Championships this summer, Division A, 
And if the, like if they don't know how to read a ball screen because you're not doing it, like what the hell? So mm -hmm. it's like you know, and some of these kids are good enough to play in like pro teams already. So you have to do it. I just think you're limiting your players if you don't. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, man. Razor, I think there's one question left. Yeah, we have two more. Time. Yeah, we have a word message from Fabian Langseeder. Fabian, can you hear us? No, I don't have myself. Um, I had one question. Thanks, first of all, for this. Um, if you have like one and a half hours um, of training, for how long would you do those pick and roll um, stuff? to not mentally overload the players like for half an hour or even like for an hour or more or your opinion on that yeah so i think it it really obviously it depends on the players and then you could spend the whole time on it if you wanted to but obviously progressing much slower and just ensuring it's not a load on working memory so instead of doing like in a practice in one of my practices with these guys we'd probably do like six different small-sided games with many different task constraints loaded in at particular times. But if, but you know, instead you could just do like three and add loads gradually. And, and it, it really just depends on the group. And really what you've just got to look for, Fabian, is how mentally overloaded do you feel they are? So if you see them making so many mistakes or you just ask them a question, something I do in my sessions now is it's like at a water break, I'll just be like, give me a thumbs up if you if you feel good, thumbs down if you feel overloaded. And I just generally get a feel for the group. So it's just a really quick way you can check in with the guys. And then there are a lot of situations where I get thumbs down, where I get like 50% or more. And then I know I'm just not doing anything new and I'm scaling it back. I think that's when it comes to planning the, the practices, All right, I have maybe these eight small-sided games, which I showed you guys today for playing against aggressive coverages. So it's my staple eight now. Now, the first week we did it last week, obviously some of that working memory is going to be taken up just by learning that small-sided game. But now in future weeks, because they already know it, their brain is going to be free just to read the situation and play instead of learning a new small-sided game. So now that means that I can do more and I can add in different task constraints and rules within each small sided game. So that's also important because obviously the first time you do something, you've obviously got to be prepared for taking up a bigger proportion of working memory. Thank you. Pleasure. So we would have two more, Alex, do you have time for two more? And that would yeah. be the last ones. Okay. So always, always time for you guys. Thanks a lot. So uh, I would take, um, Marco from Bramford and then Gabi with the last question. So those two more and that should be it for today. Cool. Okay, so learning, I'll take the spacing one first, yeah? On teaching the right spacing? Yeah, I think Marco is, Mike is on, but yeah. Yeah, Marco. I have problems with the uh, microphone. Ah, okay. No worries, Marco, I, I got it. So very simple, Again, the floor is lava. So it's, uh, it's something all the kids know. So it's like the floor is lava. So any area inside the three-point line is lava. So anytime there's a drive and kick, they've got three seconds to escape the lava. So simple. That's one. So you can do that in literally any small-sided game. Even if you just played like 3v3 feeble rules, continuous, just add the constraint of floor is lava, And you will naturally see kids passing, getting out to space, et cetera. So that to me is number one. Number two is one can't guard two. So that means just, you can also add this as a task constraint. If players are standing close to each other or bunched up, it's a turnover because you're allowing one defender to guard two because of the close space. So literally if you could teach that to under 12s and they would start to get really good spacing without knowing it. It would be implicit knowledge, just some of those two constraints. Does that help? 
so I know you've got a mic problem. Yeah, you, the mic, I think the mic problem the is there. In the chat, if that answers it, Marco. Yeah, it says thanks. So seems cool. Okay, so Gabi would be the last one. Gabi, you're on. Hi, hi, Alex. Thank you for, uh, for the for the great clinic today, like like always. Thank you so uh, much. We, we watch you and, and thanks for everything you share with us. My, my question is, um, are the constraints killing the creativity? The, the, the cons if we constrain, for example, you, I think you have understand my question, yes? I, I don't want to exemplify more, or? No, 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 it's good. Yeah, so definitely you can overkill with too many constraints, especially if it's limiting constraints. For instance, that no look one, where I said it had to be a no look, well, I wouldn't do it every time because let, let's say for instance, making a one hand pocket pass, right? They're gonna be more confident to do that while looking. And if I say you can only do something one way, they're probably not, not gonna do a no look one hand maybe because it's harder. So these limiting constraints where you say things like, okay, you can only do something like this. We can only pass, jump in, you can only finish one hand. I do that in short doses to ensure that they can experience a new technique, but I don't do it the whole time. Um, so the constraints I use are more, more open than closed in relation to how I want a particular skill to be performed. Um, does that make sense? Yaru? Yeah, cool. Because I, I see a lot nowadays where coaches are talking about constraints when they don't actually know what they are. And pe coaches are talking about constraints as only being a limiting thing. Like, okay, you can only take one dribble. You can only finish this way. You can only pass this way. It's n that's a very small element of what constraints that approach actually is. So oh, thanks a lot, Alex. I think yeah, once again, we, we, we uh, got a lot of inputs and also a lot of new ideas from, from you. And thanks for taking your time. I know you are really, really busy uh, now there and also with Junior NBA. Um, yeah, and hopefully we will see us in, in Germany in, in the next month yes, and sir. have something in, in, in life in the future also. Um, thanks also uh, to, to my colleague Marcus because that's I think his last clinic as, as a as a yeah Landestin, I don't know how it's in, in English called and we, we for sure wish him all the best in, in US and uh, we are very thankful that he helped putting this together because it was also his idea and um, yeah thank you all who were today here danke schön nochmal an alle die heute da waren und ja, wünsche euch einen schönen Abend und am 10. Mai wird die nächste Coach-Klinik da sein. Alex, do you have a last word to yes, say yes, to yes, everybody yes. here? Absolutely. Marcus, just thanks for everything, man. Obviously, we'll keep in touch, but it's been a pleasure. And uh, I definitely want to get those beers with you in Munich and everyone else on the call. CLA with beers sounds a lot more fun. Exactly. It's a good fun of learning. Cover the affordances of strong German beer. <laughs> But thanks to everything, Marcus, man. I'm looking forward to... Yeah, keeping thanks to you. Thanks to you. Good stuff. Thanks yeah. so much, Razvan. Danke auch an alle von meiner Seite. Schönen Abend noch. Ciao, ciao. Schönen Abend. Ciao. Bis in Mai. Ciao. Ich habe dein, dein Foto nicht gefunden. Ich habe alles organisiert. Ich denke, kein Foto gefunden. Nur so ein altes von dir. Ja. Von, von mir oder was? Ja, von dir natürlich, von dir, weißt du. Ja. Wird es wieder das Kinderfoto zeigen, wahrscheinlich. Ja, genau. Ja, genau. Nur das habe ich gefunden und das habe ich gesagt, nee, das zeige ich nicht mehr. Das reicht.